Tonight, one of the most popular franchises in TV history will mark a milestone. NCIS is crossing the 1,000th episode threshold. Known for its gripping storylines, tonight's monumental episode promises to be no different. Blame me, you always have. No, not for mom. It's everything after what I don't get. The job, Dad. You've already given it so much, and yet you keep doing it. Kayla, too. Why? What, what's worth keeping this family at risk? What makes NCIS so damn special? Actor Rocky Carroll, who plays director Leon Vance, joins me now. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Well, it's so good to see you again. Congratulations on this milestone. You've been on NCIS for nearly 16 years now. What do you think has been the key to making this show so successful for so long? Well, as I always say, if, if I knew the answer to that, I would bottle it and sell it at a very high price. Um, <laughs> I, I, there's so many elements. I think um, it's great storytelling. Um, uh, you know, the characters are interesting. Their camaraderie with each other. We infuse a lot of humor uh, in the storylines. Um, and, you know, it's for, you know, 21, now going into our 22nd season. Um, the audiences have been faithful and, and they've stayed with us through all the changes, cast changes. Um, we've survived four different presidential administrations. So um, it's incredible. We're in some very rare air. Rocky, you've also done a number of uh, some work behind the camera, too. I, I wanted to ask you, what's it like, you know, directing the iconic show? And do you plan on directing any future episodes? We'd love to hear. Well, you know, I, the first time I directed, I, I told someone, I said, if, I think this must be what the, being the royal wedding planner must feel like because <laughs> there were so many things to focus on. You're the first one there at, at 6.30, 6.45 a.m. You're the last one to leave. You're responsible for every element from, from in front of the camera, behind the camera, costumes, makeup, hair, wardrobe. Uh, so I think when I finished that first episode, I thought, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever get another chance to do that again. And now I've got close to, I think, at least 25 of the uh, episodes. So I guess I'm doing something right. Oh, that's for sure. Can you give us a, a sneak peek at what viewers can expect from tonight's landmark episode? It's a big one. Well, yeah, it's, it's a big one. Um, and it's the culmination of a thousand episodes from the entire NCIS universe. All all the, all the NCISs combined, um, uh, Hawaii, LA, New Orleans, uh, Sydney. Uh, so, so this is number 1000. So uh, in keeping with that, we've recruited some of the, um, some of the characters, cast members from some of the other shows to help solve tonight's case. So you'll be seeing some cast members from uh, other parts of the NCIS universe, NCIS Hawaii, NCIS LA. I'm not giving away any names, but mm -hmm. my character, uh, Director Vance and his estranged son have a have a, have a coming to terms, um, and it and it mushrooms into something that no, nobody else that nobody expected, and we need the the NCIS universe to help us get back on track. So uh, it's it's uh, it's going to be good. That's, that's that's as much as I can give away without giving away the farm. Well, Rocky Carroll, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So nice to see you. And congratulations, that 1,000th episode of NCIS that's airing tonight at 9 on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. I mean, what a show on the edge of your seats. But because you know the great thing about NCIS, too. you can just watch the show. If you, you can watch it in order or you can just dip in because mm -hmm. they're all mm -hmm. interesting shows. The last time I saw him was downstairs. You know how they have posters of all the shows? And he was walking by NCIS and I said, hey, that's you. And then they have posters of us and he said, hey, that's you. That's Very true. nice well, guy. Oh yeah, wonderful. Good, wonderful. I love and that. so good to see him behind the camera too, yeah. doing all that fine work. Absolutely. 25 episodes, incredible that yeah. he's been directing. All right, let's get a final check on what we can expect. You need to direct the sunshine here I'm because later to. on this, well, today I'm and tomorrow, perfect. To. Well done. So I'm gonna get fired from directing on Wednesday <laughs> because I'll be directing the rain. Hey, it's going to be great today. 77, nice for the Mets tonight. Terrific for your Tuesday. And then remember, rain gear on standby, middle part of the week. And that does it for CBS 2 News at 9 a.m. Our coverage continues right here on CBS News New York, streaming live 24-7. I'm Mary Calvi. I'm Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> hey, for all of us here at CBS 2, thank you for your time this morning. Go make it a great day. It's going to be a pretty one.
This is CBS News, New York. Turning to the weather now, let's get to meteorologist John Elliott with your first alert forecast. Ooh, awfully pretty there. We have a, uh, a pretty morning underway. There's one little stray shower rumbling through now, and then we wait, we warm up, and we see the possibility of a late day shower or storm south of the city. You can see much of the area. Great. Had some fog in parts of the Hudson Valley, and there is some fog upstate. And we are seeing some issues in parts of New England, but that's about it. Zooming in, let's see. Yeah, this thing is really weakening, but a few stray drops. It was actually some uh, pretty heavy rain through parts of Warren Morris County, but as it continues to journey into parts of Westchester, weakening and then yeah, the sun will shine. We see some nice numbers feeling like June later. This little boundary will bring in the possibility of a shower or storm because it's going to be 80 degrees south and west of the city today. Uh, numbers right now, 40s, 50s and low 60s. City the hot spot, the warm spot at 61. Late chance with a high of 77. It's a little boundary layer to the south, so that'd be Ocean County. Could see brief heavy rain, possibly even some hail. When you get 80 degrees, you get a lift in the atmosphere, and then you get to that cold pocket to the well, well up, you know, in the atmosphere, maybe 50, 60,000 feet, you get some hail. So that would be a feature. But then tomorrow, great. Just get outside, enjoy it. And then Wednesday, just like that. Showers are back by Wednesday night. 63 so numbers are really not bad for this time of the year but we're going to be so spoiled first part of the week and then the odds for rain go up wednesday thursday thursday in the 50s friday shapes up a bit weekend right now though is shaping up to be a little unsettled so as you make your plans and some folks i'm told even in the studio mm -hmm. are making plans for the upcoming weekend right now so right now saturday looks a little challenging not so much today today wow tomorrow even you better do, you do such a nice job of pivoting off the bed <laughs> hey, look at <laughs> say the weekend you stinks, think about it today we have, your monday we is have be great. the best weather in the country tuesday we'll right? savor it we'll savor tuesday it tuesday is great, great. <laughs> Oh, and now to breaking news, Donald Trump is now inside a Manhattan courtroom for what is the first ever criminal trial involving a former president. Jury selection begins today in his hush money trial. He is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. CBS News' Elijah Westbrook is live in lower Manhattan on, with more on what we can expect. Elijah. That's right, Mary. And as you mentioned, I mean, the big focus for today is really starting that jury selection uh, process, uh, one that could take several days, if not weeks, according to legal experts we talked to. And before we break all that down, uh, we want to go ahead and show you some live pictures inside the courthouse right here in lower Manhattan, where moments ago the uh, former president uh, spoke to cameras briefly. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Now, as for what's expected to happen today, the jury selection process will kick off, as we said. This includes the search for 12 impartial jurors, plus alter alternates, rather, whose names won't be made public. Uh, Trump faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. The charges stem from an investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney accusing him of concealing damaging information and unlawful activity from American voters before and after the 2016 election. This includes a $130,000 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to cover up an alleged affair. This will likely be a case in which the facts will be overwhelming against Mr. Trump, and yet it's still not clear whether those overwhelming facts and the overwhelming evidence will be enough to persuade a unanimous jury that the former president is guilty. 
Now, this long-awaited trial is happening as Trump continues to campaign ahead of November's election. Uh, most recently on Saturday, as we saw in that clip there, Trump's ex-lawyer Michael Cohen is expected to be a key witness against him in this case. We do want to mention the former president has pleaded not guilty to the charges and denies any wrongdoing. We are live this morning from Lower Manhattan. Elijah Westbrook, CBS News, New York. Elijah, thank you. Be sure to stay with CBS News for continuing coverage on the former president's hush money trial. We'll have live reports throughout the day outside the courtroom here on air, online, and on our streaming channel, CBS News, New York. Well, now to the Middle East, where the U.S. is working to prevent an escalation across the region following Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. President Biden has warned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. would not participate in any offensive action against Iran. CBS News' Christina Fan joins us live from the newsroom with the latest developments. Christina. Mary and Chris, this historic attack is a scenario many have feared since the October 7th Hamas attacks on Israel. Now there is concern it could spiral into a regional war. Following Israel's interception of more than 300 Iranian missiles and drones, the UN Security Council met in New York Sunday at the request of Israel. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. The president's made it clear we're not looking for a war with Iran, we're not looking for a broader regional conflict, and everything we've been doing since the 7th has been designed to prevent that outcome. Iran says the attack was in response to an airstrike, widely blamed on Israel, that destroyed its embassy in Syria and killed two generals earlier this month. President Biden convened world leaders of the G7. CBS News has learned Biden also told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. would not participate in any offensive operations against Iran. We managed to uh, um, sustain or, or to uh, not be damaged or to have casualties in the way that the Iranian wanted us to have. And that doesn't mean um, that uh, it should not be retaliated by Israel. Iranian-born Benny Sapti works at the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel. Inside the country that hates mostly Israel, 80% of them are supporting Israel. This is a very strange thing. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he spoke with Biden, and he and Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell are urging the passage of a bipartisan national security aid package that includes funding for Israel's defense systems. Israel expended uh, about over a billion dollars in, in defending itself, and the security supplemental would replenish that kind of aid. And Iran's mission to the U.N. wrote on social media that they do not plan any further attacks and warned the U.S. to not get involved. In the newsroom, Christina Fan, CBS 2 News. Yeah, thank you. In our area, a show of support for Israel amid the ongoing war against Hamas and the attack by Iran. A crowd marched through Central Park yesterday carrying the Israeli flag. Some are concerned the violence in the Middle East could escalate. Sheila Lewis teaches meditation at the JCC on the Upper West Side and has family in Israel. Try to guide people to feel what's in their hearts, and our hearts are breaking for everyone. It's a miserable situation, but people are doing what they need to do to protect themselves and protect their loved ones. NYPD says while well, there are no credible threats, security is being stepped up at synagogues in the area. Stay with CBS 2 for the latest on Iran's attack on Israel on the air and online at CBSNewYork.com. Now to breaking news in upstate New York. Two law enforcement officers are dead after a shootout with a suspect in Syracuse. Police say the tragedy unfolded when two Syracuse police officers tried to pull over a suspicious car last night around 7 p.m., but the driver took off. Officers tracked the car by a license plate to a home in Liverpool and asked for backup from the Onondaga County Sheriff's Office after learning the suspect might be armed. They heard what, what sounded like uh, someone manipulating a firearm from inside the residence. Moments later, there was an exchange of gunfire between at least one suspect and the officers and the deputies. As a result of the exchange of gunfire, one SPD officer and one Onondaga County Sheriff's deputy were struck by gunfire as well as the suspect. The suspect was also killed. The police chief says the Syracuse police officer who died had about three years on the job. 
The sheriff called his fallen deputy a seasoned law enforcement officer who was very well liked in his community. Lou, this morning police are now investigating a deadly shooting this morning in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. It happened just after 4 a.m. at East 149th Street and Morris Avenue. Police say two male victims were shot. One was pronounced dead at Lincoln Hospital. A second victim is now in critical condition after being shot multiple times. So far, no arrests have been reported. The man charged with randomly punching a child is still waiting to be arraigned. 30-year-old Jean Carlos Varzu is facing a felony assault charge. He's accused of assaulting a nine-year-old girl on Saturday inside Grand Central Terminal just before noon. She was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. We've also learned that this attack happened while Varzuela was out on bail. Police say he was arrested April 4th for assaulting an elderly woman at Grand Central Terminal. Two firefighters and two civilians were injured in a late night fire in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. The FDNY says the fire broke out shortly after 11 o'clock last night at a building on Fifth Avenue between 49th and 50th Streets. The fire was burning on the second floor and extended into the attic. More than 100 firefighters and EMS personnel responded and had the flames under control within an hour. We're told both civilians were taken to Lutheran Hospital with smoke inhalation. One firefighter also was hospitalized for smoke inhalation, a second with a minor injury. All are in stable condition. A fire at a high-rise apartment building in Gramercy injured at least four people, including a firefighter. It happened just after 5.30 yesterday afternoon on Waterside Plaza. The FDNY says the fire started on the sixth floor of the 40-story high-rise. A 51-year-old woman and 22-year-old man were taken to the hospital with smoke inhalation. A firefighter also suffered a minor injury. We came in, there was heavy smoke on arrival, heavy fire, the door was left open, and um, our units were able to secure the door and uh, put water on the fire. So it was, uh, it was a tough job for our units, but they did, uh, they did a great job and were able to get the fire out. A 49-year-old man was also treated for minor injuries at the scene, no word yet on what caused the fire. Coming up, a troubling new study finds a link between accelerated aging at the beginning stages of cancer in young adults. We talked to Dr. Nidhi Kumar about what's behind the shift and what you can do to slow the aging process. Plus, I'm paying them for to be on hold for two hours. I like your time is not valuable. They need to come up with something better. Residents in Suffolk County calling a non-emergency line more of a headache than a help. The sweeping changes to 311 after years of complaints about long wait times.
jumping ahead feels like a June kind of setup over the next few days. Warm sunshine today. Kids see a, a stray shower south of the city. Even a storm possible tonight, but again, very isolated. Tuesday is a treat. Then it's wet and cooler starting Wednesday. 77 feels like June today. Delightful for your Tuesday start to finish. Wednesday, plan on clouds, and then the showers return during the day. Just 63 for a high, barely getting out of the 50s on Thursday. A new study from the UK has found that younger adults are aging faster than ever. To make matters worse, researchers have also found a connection between accelerated aging and early onset of cancers. Dr. Nidhi Kumar is on call to tell us more about the study and what we can do to slow the clock down. Good morning, Dr. Kumar. Good morning. So let's break down this study a little more. What has happened in recent years, do you think, to cause this shift? You know, the study doesn't address this, but what it did find is that people that are born after 1965 risk of accelerated aging. And what that translates to is a higher risk of early onset cancers, about a 4% increased risk of early onset lung cancer, 20% increased risk of GI cancer, and about 35% risk of uterine cancer. The study was conducted in the UK, 150,000 individuals, but again, it didn't address the why. Now, I think we can speculate a little. Life has become a lot more stressful. While technology has made us more efficient, it really does add a lot of stress to our lives, our diet, environmental factors, all of it together is really aging us. What do you think is the difference between chronological age and biological age, and can that be reversed? Well, chronological aging is how many birthday parties have you had? Really, you know, how old are you? While well, biological age is really what your uh, cellular age is. You know, what is your general health? How well are you actually aging on the cellular level? And for many people, they don't match up. Now, can you reverse age? Well, the answer is yes, but we're not exactly there yet in medicine. There is a $60 billion anti-aging industry, but that's more superficial. It will give you the appearance of looking younger, but true reverse aging happens on the cellular level. And there is research now for technologies and medications looking at changing the gut microbiome, changing your hormones, and even changing the activation of certain genes to help us anti-age. So, so something that's definitely on the horizon. And doctor, another study also came out recently connecting accelerated aging and pregnancy. Tell us about that. I mean, did we need a study for that? <laughs> you know, like you have kids and then, you know, you worry, but no, truly um, the study did come out uh, led by uh, researchers at that found that with pregnancy, you are increasing your biological age about two years with every pregnancy. Now, the good part of that is that there is some regression in the postpartum period. Uh, what this means for long-term mortality and health of women was not addressed in the study, and there needs to be more studies done looking at that. But, you know, we do have an issue with maternal health in our country, and this study just emphasizes how important it is to be healthy before you get pregnancy and really pay attention to the health of uh, young mothers. Uh, the study did also look at men and uh, men did not have accelerated aging even though their female uh, partners did during pregnancy. And there's so much out there in the area of anti-aging, but what is actually scientifically backed to work? Okay. Well, get some sleep. Poor sleep ages us biologically in an accelerated manner. So get some good sleep, use sunblock. UV radiation accelerates the aging of the cells in our face. Strength training as exercise. Cardio is important, but strength training is very important because not only do we lose muscle mass as we age, but it, uh, strength training also improves our memory, believe it or not, because it activates the hippocampus, the same part of the brain related to memory. Inflammation is also a big part of aging. How do you want to cut inflammation instantly? Stop smoking, stop drinking, and stop eating the ultra-processed foods. And then finally, 
mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques, meditation, yoga, tai chi. This has actually been shown to work on our epigenome, which means that while we can't change our genes, we can actually activate genes that help us reverse age. And those techniques have been shown to do that. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kumar. We appreciate it. And remember, you can Thank see you. Dr. Nidhi Kumar's reports every Monday at 7.15 right here on CBS News New York. During the month of April, advocates are spotlighting people who have lost limbs or have limbs that are shaped differently. CBS 2's Danya Back has introduced us to a special program that teaches children and teens that their differences are what makes them extraordinary. What's your favorite subject? I like math. 19-year-old Ethan and 7-year-old Ramon have a special bond. Despite the age gap, the two share what makes them unique. He's like fun to me. He's very nice to me and kind. He's definitely very ambitious. I think a lot more ambitious than I was at that age. They both were born with left-hand limb difference. They met through a program called CATCH, which stands for Center for the Achievement of Teens and Children with Hands Differences. One of the challenges of having a limb difference is being stared at, being pointed at, uh, people being afraid that you're in pain or uh, maybe pointing at you or not including you in the game. Dr. Nina Lightdell Murick is the director of pediatric hand surgery at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She created Catch as a way to extend care and support past surgery. And the best way to care for them is to introduce them to other people. It introduced me to a community of other kids like me, and it was great because it gives a sense of belonging, right? I feel like as people, we all just want to be understood and have a sense of belonging. Five of every 10,000 newborns in the U.S. have some difference in the arm, hand, forearm, or fingers. The sense of community and empowerment Catch provides reaches beyond the patients. I realize not to put limitations on him. Whatever fears and things that I have as a mom, don't put that on him. Let's just, just let them be themselves. Whether playing the ukulele, piano, or basketball. It's hard to, but you're, you'll get there. Through their bond, Ethan and Ramon are reminded that their ordinary is extraordinary. Donya back is CBS News, Los Angeles. Valley Hospital's long way new location in Paramus, New Jersey is now open. For the past year, volunteers have been preparing to move from the former Ridgewood location to the newly constructed hospital in Paramus. Doors at the old hospital closed around 6 Sunday morning and more than six dozen ambulances helped transport patients from Ridgewood to Paramus. We're going to be delivering a different level of care in this very innovative um, facility. What we focused on in the design was about uh, caring for our patients, making them comfortable. The Ridgewood location will now become an outpatient facility for non-emergency procedures. And coming up, April is designated Limb Loss Awareness Month. I'm Donya Backus with a look at a program that's helping children with differences make heartwarming bonds.
Hi everybody, we've got a uh, wild and warm and wonderful way to start the week. 77, you know, we had a shower this morning, going to leave in the chance for a stray shower or a storm this afternoon. Ocean County, well south of the city. But yeah, I mean, it does not feel like uh, tax day, not that taxing at all. Low to mid 70s dominate the Hudson Valley into Connecticut. It's going to be warmer to the south and west and we see a relatively quiet night. We do have to leave in the possibility though of an evening shower or storm south and east. Pretty consistent model runs where it'd be Ocean County could be as early as six o'clock and then you know it wraps up and then we're going to see a nice day tomorrow. 72 tomorrow really a nice day because it's dry pleasantly warm just terrific for one day because Wednesday it's a total turnaround. You're cooler by at least 10 and then we see showers later Wednesday, raw and wet Thursday, eking our way back to 60 on Friday. Suffolk residents have long been complaining about the county's 311 non-emergency line. Some calling it more of a headache than a help, but the county is now making some changes. New Suffolk County Executive Ed Romain says he found the 301 system needed a big fix with wait times up to two and a half hours. Half of all callers simply gave up or hung up. The changes include routing calls differently instead of hundreds of daily calls for every agency flooding. 311 calls can now be directed to specific departments. People get frustrated when they call and they have to wait forever. No one picks up or when they pick up, they ba get bounced all over the county. That's something that we want to put in the rearview mirror. Now call wait times are down to under three minutes. Abandoned calls are down to only 10% and callers can request a call back. Up next, local business owners demanding payment for work done at a popular holiday event. What a CBS2 investigation uncovered about the company at the center of the controversy. Plus, the first ever criminal trial involving a former president happening today. The latest in Donald Trump's hush money trial as jury selection gets underway. We'll be right back here on CBS News New York.
This is CBS News, New York. Oh, and now to breaking news, Donald Trump is now inside a Manhattan courtroom for what is the first ever criminal trial involving a former president. Jury selection begins today in his hush money trial. He is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. CBS News' Elijah Westbrook is live in lower Manhattan on, with more on what we can expect. Elijah. That's right, Mary. And as you mentioned, I mean, the big focus for today is really starting that jury selection uh, process, uh, one that could take several days, if not weeks, according to legal experts we talked to. And before we break all that down, uh, we want to go ahead and show you some live pictures inside the courthouse right here in Lower Manhattan, where moments ago the uh, former president uh, spoke to cameras briefly. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Now, as for what's expected to happen today, the jury selection process will kick off, as we said. This includes the search for 12 impartial jurors, plus alter alternates, rather, whose names won't be made public. Uh, Trump faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. The charges stem from an investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney accusing him of concealing damaging information and unlawful activity from American voters before and after the 2016 election. This includes a $130,000 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to cover up an alleged affair. This will likely be a case in which the facts will be overwhelming against Mr. Trump, and yet it's still not clear whether those overwhelming facts and the overwhelming evidence will be enough to persuade a unanimous jury that the former president is guilty. Now, this long-awaited trial is happening as Trump continues to campaign ahead of November's election. Uh, most recently on Saturday, as we saw in that clip there, Trump's ex-lawyer Michael Cohen is expected to be a key witness against him in this case. We do want to mention the former president has pleaded not guilty to the charges and denies any wrongdoing. We are live this morning from Lower Manhattan. Elijah Westbrook, CBS News, New York. Elijah, thank you. Be sure to stay with CBS for continuing coverage on the former president's hush money trial. We'll have live reports throughout the day outside the courtroom here on air, online, and on our streaming channel, CBS News New York. Turning to the weather now, let's get to meteorologist John Elliott with your first alert forecast. Ooh, awfully pretty there. We have a, uh, a pretty morning underway. There's one little stray shower rumbling through now, and then we wait, we warm up, and we see the possibility of a late day shower or storm south of the city. You can see much of the area. Great. Had some fog in parts of the Hudson Valley, and there is some fog upstate. And we are seeing some issues in parts of New England, but that's about it. Zooming in, let's see. Yeah, this thing is really weakening, but a few stray drops. It was actually some uh, pretty heavy rain through parts of Warren Morris County, but as it continues to journey into parts of Westchester, weakening and then yeah, the sun will shine. We have see some nice numbers feeling like June later. This little boundary will bring in the possibility of a shower or storm because it's going to be 80 degrees south and west of the city today. Uh, numbers right now, 40s, 50s, and low 60s. City the hot spot, the warm spot at 61. Late chance with a high of 77. It's a little boundary layer to the south, so that'd be Ocean County. Could see brief heavy rain, possibly even some hail. When you get 80 degrees, you get lift in the atmosphere and then you get to that cold pocket to the well well up you know in the atmosphere maybe 50 60,000 feet you get some hail so that would be a feature but then tomorrow great just get outside enjoy it and then Wednesday just like that showers are back by Wednesday night 
63. So numbers are really not bad for this time of the year, but we're going to be so spoiled first part of the week. And then the odds for rain go up Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday in the 50s. Friday shapes up a bit. Weekend right now, though, is shaping up to be a little unsettled. So as you make your plans and some folks I'm told even in the studio mm -hmm. are making plans for the upcoming weekend right now. So right now Saturday looks a little challenging. Not so much today. Today Wow, tomorrow, even you better. Do, you do such a nice job of pivoting off the of bad news. <laughs> hey, look at Say you're the weekend when you stinks, think about it, but today, we Monday, your Monday is great. We have the best weather in the country Tuesday. We'll right? savor it. We'll savor Tuesday it. Tuesday is Thanks, great. great. <laughs> And now to the Middle East, where the U.S. is working to prevent an escalation across the region following Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. The U.S. assisted Israel in intercepting more than 350 Iranian drones and missiles on Saturday. There was only minimal damage to an Israeli military base. President Biden is now encouraging Israel to show restraint in its response, saying that Washington would not participate in any offensive action against Iran. Iran's attack comes after a suspected Israeli strike in Syria that killed two Two generals in an Iranian consulate building. Well, concerns are growing here at home over the increased tensions in the Middle East. CBS News' Lori Bonero has reaction to this latest act of violence against Israel. Bring them home. Bring them home. A show of support for Israel as marchers carry the Israeli flag in Central Park, a day after Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel and the ongoing war in Gaza. I think that we all very much want peace in the Middle East. I think when everybody lays down their weapons and sits down to talk, there will be some peace. But there are concerns the violence will escalate. Sheila Lewis teaches meditation at the JCC on the Upper West Side and has family in Israel. I try to guide people to feel what's in their hearts, and our hearts are breaking for everyone. It's a miserable situation, but people are doing what they need to do to protect themselves, to protect their loved ones. No one wants anything to escalate further. Rabbi Joshua Davidson leads the congregation at Temple Emmanuel, where security is heightened. He says he's relieved the attack didn't cause any damage or deaths. The Jewish community is greatly appreciative of the Biden administration's efforts and steadfast support in defense of Israel. Less than 10 blocks away, we caught up with Nando, who was born in Iran. He tells us the direct attack was not a surprise. Was this something happening between the governments? Yeah. And um, I believe it has nothing to do with the people that live in there. He agrees violence isn't the solution to end the conflict. This is not the way to continue their fight, practically. So they have to cool it down and just bring it to the table. While the NYPD says there are no credible threats here in New York City, security has been stepped up here at Temple Emanuel and at synagogues throughout the city. On the Upper East Side, Lori Bordenero, CBS2 News. Police are searching for the gunman who shot a man while he was riding a moped in Queens. The 55-year-old driver of the moped was taken to the hospital in stable condition. A female riding on the back of the moped fell to the ground and was injured. This happened late Saturday night on Redfern Avenue in Far Rockaway. Investigators believe the shooting was targeted. Also new this morning, police are searching for a suspect accused in a slashing inside a subway station in Midtown. Happened at 12.30 this morning at the Rockefeller Center subway station. Police say the victim was cut in the face while making a purchase at an MTA kiosk. He was treated at the scene by EMS and is expected to be okay. Two vans crashed in downtown Brooklyn, injuring more than a dozen people. You can see the banged up U-Haul van at Livingston Street in Elm Place. Police say it happened just before 3 p.m. yesterday. They say the U-Haul slammed into another van, which was transporting people around the city. 15 people suffered minor injuries. No word yet on what led up to the collision. A bow capsized in the East River, sending four people to the hospital. It happened just before 2 yesterday afternoon near Herman McNeil Park in College Point, Queens. The FDNY says the NYPD's harbor unit pulled four people out of the water. They were taken to New York Presbyterian Hospital and are expected to be okay. Not clear what caused that boat to capsize. Well, sentencing for the Russ movie armorer convicted of involuntary manslaughter expected today. Prosecutors in New Mexico were asking for 18 months in prison. Last month, the jury found Hannah Gutierrez-Reed guilty for the onset shooting death of cinematographer Elena Hutchins back in 2021. Gutierrez-Reed was responsible for gun safety and storage on set. Hutchins was killed by a live round of ammo fired from a prop gun held by Alec Baldwin. Baldwin also faces an involuntary manslaughter charge. 
It was billed as the largest holiday light show in the country, but now three New York companies say their bills are being ignored after lighting up City Field. And as CBS2 investigative reporter Tim McNicholas has learned, they're not the only people who say they're owed thousands of dollars. This is my business. I built this from the ground up. Michael Girls Pedalvin Company makes dreams come true, creating massive holiday decorations at their Hoboken workshop. And when the producer of the Amaze Light Festival hired them for this display at City Field in 2022, girls' own oh, dreams lit up. This is everything that I worked for, and it was a, a great opportunity, what I thought was a great opportunity. And then it turned into a nightmare. Girl says his team spent thousands of hours and dollars creating and installing their decorations at City Field and two other displays in Illinois and Maryland. But Pedal and Company was not the main organizer. They were contracted by artistic holiday designs. And Girl says that company only paid them a quarter of what they're owed. It's a $450,000 deficit that we still have not recovered from. And he's not alone. The Tinley Park Police Department outside of Chicago says artistic holiday Designs owes them $70,000 for security at the 2022 Illinois Festival. Go and the director of a teenage dance group tells CBS Chicago the company owes them tens of thousands of dollars for their performances at that same festival. It's very, very simple. We, we signed a contract, we were there, we did our job. They need to be paid. Pedal and Company is one of three companies that each sued artistic holiday designs, demanding they pay up for their work on the city field display. Girl says artistic CEO Derek Norwood texted him describing financial struggles, but a press release from June of 2022 said an investment group had raised $5 million for the company's upcoming holiday events. I just want to be paid. A spokesperson for the Mets and City Field would not tell CBS2 whether they're owed any money or what they do to vet the financial stability of vendors. I thought there were some um, protocols that would be set in place that would not allow the situation to happen. When we asked Norwood if he's going to pay back Girl and the others, he texted us no comment and he did not answer our calls. Girl says he knows the feeling and it doesn't feel much like holiday cheer. Tim McNicholas, CBS2 Investigates. If you have a story you'd like the CBS2 investigative team to look into, let us know. You can email your tips to CBS2investigates at cbs.com or call the tip line at the number on your screen. Today is Patriots Day in Boston, and that means some of the best runners in the world are getting ready for the Boston Marathon. 30,000 runners from more than 100 countries are expected to take part. It's one of the world's six major marathons. The elite men's race begins at 9.37 this morning. The elite women start 10 minutes later at 9.47. And the first wave of runners in the mass start will head out at 10 a.m. We're taking a quick break. Up next, the Notre Dame Cathedral nears completion five years after a devastating fire. Hunters came from United States, from England, from Denmark, from Spain. They come to work on Notre Dame, and it's a very fantastic spirit. A look at the progress made by craftsmen near and far and when the historic church could reopen. We'll be right back.
jumping ahead feels like a June kind of setup over the next few days. Warm sunshine today. Kids see a, a stray shower south of the city. Even a storm possible tonight, but again, very isolated. Tuesday is a treat. Then it's wet and cooler starting Wednesday. 77 feels like June today. Delightful for your Tuesday start to finish. Wednesday, plan on clouds and then the showers return during the day. Just 63 for a high barely getting out of the 50s on Thursday. Today marks five years since the fire that des nearly destroyed Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Since then, there's been an extraordinary effort to save and restore the century's old landmark, including by an American craftsman. Here's CBS's Elaine Cobb. Last year, Hank Silver was running a small carpentry business in Massachusetts. Through a contact in France, he was offered a rare chance to join a team in Normandy preparing timber to rebuild the nave of Notre Dame. I could not say no to that opportunity. It's an opportunity that happens once in a lifetime wouldn't even be the right term. It's once in a millennium, really. The monumental task of restoring Notre Dame after the 2019 fire called for artisans skilled in traditional building methods. We first hewed all the logs using axes in order to recreate that rippled finish that you were able to see in the original cathedral in the 13th century framing. There were unexpected challenges. The architects asked us to reproduce all of the deformations that had accrued over 800 years. So the ridge is not a straight line. And so we had to follow this curvature. Then he came to Paris to set the timber trusses in place. Many uh, carpenters came from United States, from England, from Denmark, from Spain, uh, because they were fond of uh, these uh, techniques, fond of uh, oak. And they come to work on Notre Dame, and it's a very fantastic spirit. There's still a lot of work left to be done to restore Notre Dame to its former glory. But everyone here is confident it will be ready for the planned reopening in December. Four months ago, the spire rose again into the Paris skyline, topped with a recreation of the original gold cross and rooster. The rooster holds several holy relics, but also... But they created a second chamber, and it's got a scroll with the names of everybody who worked on the cathedral. Their cool? names in there. Yeah, isn't that, that cool? That is supremely yeah, cool. It's, way, it's right up there. Okay. Protecting the city. With his work on the restoration almost done, Silver says he'd like to stay in France. He took advantage of a site visit by the French president to plead his case. I did hand Emmanuel Macron a letter requesting French citizenship. He has not been texting me every day much to my disappointment. Hank Silver remains hopeful and says he's looking forward to seeing Notre Dame reopen at the end of this year. Elaine Cobb, CBS News, Paris. Samsung scores a major victory over Apple. According to research firm IDC, the company just knocked Apple out of the top spot for smartphone makers. Data shows smartphone shipments rose nearly 8% the first quarter of 2024, with Samsung taking over 20% of that share. Meanwhile, Apple shipments dropped 10%. The price of forever stamps could go up for the second time this year. The U.S. Postal Service is proposing a 5% increase from 68 cents to 73 cents. It comes after the price went up by 2 cents in January. The proposed increase is part of the Postal Service's 10-year plan toward profitability. The Postal Regulatory Commission will review the request. If approved, it would take effect on July 14th. A beloved novel and classic film, now a Broadway musical. We speak with the cast of The Outsiders and Broadway and Beyond. You're streaming CBS News New York. We'll be right back.
In Broadway and Beyond, the popular novel and film The Outsiders is now an inventive new musical. Creative staging and choreography elevate the classic tale of teen angst and belonging. CBS News' Dave Carlin reports from the Theater District. Brody Grant plays 14-year-old Ponyboy Curtis, whose love of literature and writing makes him a standout in his gang of greasers. He endures chaos and violence in 1960s Oklahoma, and he uses art as an escape. I feel a deep connection to it. I mean, I'm a songwriter myself, and so Ponyboy is a budding artist, a budding writer, and he doesn't know it. The coming-of-age story is a favorite for generations of middle and high school students, and they're returning to it on Broadway. I read the book, and I really was excited. It was amazing. Yeah, I want to come back. <laughs> it was made into a classic movie in 1983. The musical's young cast includes many making Broadway debuts. They say a highlight is getting to spend time with the celebrated 75-year-old author of The Outsiders. What we are hearing repeatedly on this red carpet is a deep appreciation and love for Essie Hinton's book. Angelina Jolie, one of the show's producers, had these words of praise. I love the book and I love that it was written by a young woman all those years ago and, and, and how she saw the world and how she saw men. When I read the book in seventh grade, it's the first time I saw that white people could treat other white people the way they, I felt they treated black people. That didn't, they didn't, it didn't use the word classism. I didn't learn about classism until like 10th, 11th grade, you know, but to have the seeds of that in middle school, you know, this book speaks to people and how people treat people. I love the book. I love the character. The character is so special to my mother because she introduced me to the book. So, um, I mean, it's definitely been something that I'm just like, I, I hold nothing back. Cast members say this story matters, and audiences tell them they marvel at the inventive staging and score, dazzling choreography, and all the heart. When you come in there, you're getting authentic people, you're getting authentic sets, and you're getting something different. We're taking a risk. I think they've absolutely nailed the lyrics, and I, I think that it's, it's a joy to sing every night. There are people who've seen the show four and five times already, and we've only been running for three weeks, you know, and it's, something's happening. On the stage, it may be Tulsa 1967, but it also feels very now. In the Theater District, Dave Carlin, CBS 2 News. The Outsiders is on stage at the Jacobs Theater. It's one of 16 new musicals this season in a crowded field competing for Tony Awards. The nominations will be announced April 30th. And you can watch the Tonys live from Lincoln Center. That's June 16th here on CBS2 and streaming on Paramount+. Plus.
This is CBS News, New York. Oh, and now to breaking news, Donald Trump is now inside a Manhattan courtroom for what is the first ever criminal trial involving a former president. Jury selection begins today in his hush money trial. He is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. CBS News' Elijah Westbrook is live in lower Manhattan on, with more on what we can expect. Elijah. That's right, Mary. And as you mentioned, I mean, the big focus for today is really starting that jury selection uh, process, uh, one that could take several days, if not weeks, according to legal experts we talked to. And before we break all that down, uh, we want to go ahead and show you some live pictures inside the courthouse right here in Lower Manhattan, where moments ago the uh, former president uh, spoke to cameras briefly. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Now, as for what's expected to happen today, the jury selection process will kick off, as we said. This includes the search for 12 impartial jurors, plus alter alternates, rather, whose names won't be made public. Uh, Trump faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. The charges stem from an investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney accusing him of concealing damaging information and unlawful activity from American voters before and after the 2016 election. This includes a $130,000 hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to cover up an alleged affair. This will likely be a case in which the facts will be overwhelming against Mr. Trump, and yet it's still not clear whether those overwhelming facts and the overwhelming evidence will be enough to persuade a unanimous jury that the former president is guilty. Now, this long-awaited trial is happening as Trump continues to campaign ahead of November's election. Uh, most recently on Saturday, as we saw in that clip there, Trump's ex-lawyer Michael Cohen is expected to be a key witness against him in this case. We do want to mention the former president has pleaded not guilty to the charges and denies any wrongdoing. We are live this morning from Lower Manhattan. Elijah Westbrook, CBS News, New York. Elijah, thank you. Be sure to stay with CBS News for continuing coverage on the former president's hush money trial. We'll have live reports throughout the day outside the courtroom here on air, online and on our streaming channel CBS News New York. Turning to the weather now, let's get to meteorologist John Elliott with your first alert forecast. Ooh, awfully pretty there. We have a, uh, a pretty morning underway. There's one little stray shower rumbling through now and then we wait, we warm up and we see the possibility of a late day shower or storm south of the city. You can see much of the area. Great. Had some fog in parts of the Hudson Valley and there is some fog upstate. And we are seeing some issues in parts of New England, but that's about it. Zooming in, let's see. Yeah, this thing is really weakening, but a few stray drops. It was actually some uh, pretty heavy rain through parts of Warren Morris County, but as it continues to journey into parts of Westchester, weakening and then yeah, the sun will shine. We see some nice numbers feeling like June later. This little boundary will bring in the possibility of a shower or storm because it's going to be 80 degrees south and west of the city today. Uh, numbers right now, 40s, 50s and low 60s. City the hot spot, the warm spot at 61. Late chance with a high of 77. It's a little boundary layer to the south, so that'd be Ocean County. Could see brief heavy rain, possibly even some hail. When you get 80 degrees, you get a lift in the... This is breaking news. Happening right now, Mayor Adams is making a housing and public safety related announcement at City Hall. Let's listen in. 
and we are here this morning to talk about an action that the administration is taking to help support survivors and families touched by domestic violence. I'll let the mayor get into details, but some of you know that I have a personal story as a child witness of domestic violence. When we were growing up, before I was six years old, there was violence in our household. And so as I was thinking about it today, in the midst of all of the chaos that was happening, what was the thing that really steadied my mom and my brothers and myself? And I think it was stability, her stability, and making sure that she was okay. It was security and feeling like we were safe. And it was permanency, which is a weird word to use, but the idea that our little house in Queens, that when I look at it now seems super small, but was so important to us and the fact that we were able to have our home. She was a registered nurse, so she had a career. We had our St. Catharines of Siena, thank God for the nuns at the school and for our community. Those are the things that children need, but that adults need also when they're going through challenges. Before I hold, hand it over to the mayor, let me tell you who's here today. We have Department of Social Services Commissioner Molly Park, Mayor's Office to End Domestic Gender-Based Violence Acting Commissioner Saloni Sethi. We have Administrator uh, Carter is here today. We have Nicole Bran Braca, say it again, Nicole, Branca the executive director of New Destiny and many others from New Destiny. And we have Daenerys Espinel, survivor of domestic violence, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about um, her experience. With that, I am going to turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for that uh, personal narrative. And that's what I believe is really the trademark of this administration. Uh, each one of us bring our own story. And it's more than just governing. Uh, sometimes we politicize instead of personalizing uh, the impact of these policies that we're putting in place. And, uh, you know, I too see how small mom's house is right now, but uh, we always had a home. And no matter how abusive, uh, you know, dad during his moments as he was, uh, we had that home. We had that room, we had our place that we can close the door and cry silently. Uh, and just watch your mom the next day with some of the physical presence of it. But she was always just strong. And she would just say, uh, just, you know, uh, children, we're going to continue to survive. But these are real stories. And the home does not displace the pain, uh, but it gives you a place to escape. And it's, it's just a moment. We talked about this on the campaign trail. And we stated that we were going to do something about domestic violence. Uh, in this city, and this is one of the many steps. It's not the ending step, but it's one of the many steps. And uh, as I look at Daenerys, I uh, think about as borough president, you know, many people don't realize what the various cultures we have in this city. Uh, you think uh, everyday New Yorkers don't report it. You go into these various cultures uh, and various societies, various communities that could be insulated. Uh, you are ostracized if you report domestic violence. And uh, Bahi, who is part of my team now, we uh, were able to support the opening of a Muslim um, shelter for women who were victims of domestic violence. Uh, that was a significant moment because many of them had nowhere to go. Uh, nothing to do and and you know when you look at if English is a second language How challenging it is if you come from one of the insulate insulated communities in our city now many uh, Where a woman is trapped inside and they have to just live with the abuse they get a lot of um, Attacks from their loved ones their family members. Why are you leaving? Why are you embarrassing the community? Why are you? Um, putting your children through that and, and the cases are unbelievable and we hear them over and over again uh, But we are we are committed uh, to tackling this head-on. It's a well-kept secret in our city in my years as a police officer, it was always known of tell the, the abuser was told just to walk it off, walk around the block. Um, you know, they would discourage the women, all men, um, from reporting uh, the abuse. Uh, and we just had to stop. And that's what this administration is doing. So kudos to you, uh, Deputy Mayor williams Isom, as you bring your personal narrative to changing the narrative, what, um, 
abusers are doing and those who are abused, what they're going through. Everyone deserves a safe uh, home and a safe relationship and to be given the freedom and dignity that they deserve and not have to deal with domestic and or gender-based violence. And for too many New Yorkers, home is not safe and you are taught, caught in that web of not being able to move forward uh, economically and a place to live and a place to take care of your loved ones. And their lives are ripped apart due to the abuse and the, and the violence. You know, imagine coming home afraid to walk into your home because someone is there that's going to physically, verbally abuse you. That is so traumatic because home is your safety and for far too many, they are not experiencing that safety. And their options are narrow because escape can have terrible consequences on their ability to earn money, find a place to live and simply stay safe. And too often domestic violence survivors end up in shelters as they are forced to leave their homes. <clears throat> no one should have to experience this and no one should have to go through this. And no one should have to live in pain and fear every day. The domestic violence can happen anywhere in the city. We had an incident on the subway yesterday where a person attacked of uh, their loved one and two transit employees came to their aid and those transit employees were slashed. We had an incident where a, a woman was pushed to the tracks and lost her legs because of domestic abuse. Uh, the, the full scope of this abuse is really the number of assaults and even homicides. You'll see a significant presence of domestic violence that's attached to it. And that's why today we are giving domestic and gender-based violence survivors hope with Project Home, a pilot program to provide rapid housing assistance uh, to domestic violence survivors with children living in shelters. We are going to help 100 families in this pilot rebuild their lives, find safe, permanent homes, and reduce the time they have to spend in shelter. We are also announcing expanding eligibility for supportive and for and affordable housing for domestic violence survivors. For too long, bureaucratic rules have prevented survivors from applying for supportive and affordable housing that was set aside for families leaving city shelter. But we're putting it into that and ensuring that survivors have, been, have even more permanent housing options available to them. Allowing clients to apply directly uh, to more units and shortening of their stays in shelter. Domestic and gender-based violence is, is a public safety problem that we need to not only address by ensuring those who are abusers are held accountable, but not to continue the abuse by having a bureaucratic process that are not allowed the stabilization that Deputy Mayor Williams Isom was speaking about. And just in 2023, there were more than 245,000 domestic violence incidents reports filed by the New York City Police Department. And when you look at the number, you're talking about 700 acts a day. Uh, Project Home and other housing eligibility expansion will be a lifeline for survivors, open the door to a safe home and future. And we can, we're gonna need our partners to do that. Hats off and just thank you to New Destiny Housing for partnering with us uh, to get this done and telling us the best way to get it done because they're on the front line and they can help us be smarter as we execute these plans. I cannot say thank you enough to the entire team that's here. This is real work and you have to be committed to this work to get it right. When we provide housing and service to domestic violence, survivors and their families, we created a better, better environment for our city. And so today's Project Home Pilot is another commitment delivered from Women Forward NYC, something that our women deputy mayors and their team have put together and we are implementing on these projects of more than $43 million investments that addresses the needs of women in the five boroughs with an emphasis on women of color and LGBTQ plus uh, community. This announcement also builds on the work we have already begun to tackle domestic and gender-based violence head on. And I was proud to sign two bills in my first year in office that provided support for domestic 
and gender-based violence survivors. In the mayor's office to end the domestic and gender-based violence, continues to do incredible work. I want to thank them for what they're doing by remaining on the ground. We cannot tolerate dom domestic violence in our city. We must lead from the front. Uh, New York City is going to make sure we send the right message that will cascade out throughout the entire country. When we came into office two years ago, we were clear with our mission, public safety, and this is part of that, revitalizing our economy and making the city more livable for every New Yorker. It is not livable if our victims are living in fear. And we will continue to be steadfast and fight against a domestic violence and ensure that we can create the right environment. Thank you to everyone that's involved. Thank you, Mayor. I'm having so many thoughts, but one is that it's a program enha enhancement, but it's also a policy change. People say that we don't do pol enough policy work, <laughs> right? We probably don't talk about it enough, but how does it reflect our values and, and the New York that we want to see for um, our New Yorkers in the future? Nicole, come on up from New Destiny. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Nicole Branca, I'm, the exec I'm a very tall executive director um, for New Destiny Housing. Uh, we work to end the cycle of abuse and homelessness for DV survivors and their families, and we do this by connecting them to safe, permanent, affordable housing and services so that they can find safety and rebuild their lives. So this is a very big day for us. Um, every two minutes, the NYPD receives a report of domestic violence. That means that since this press conference began, eight people have reported being abused. It takes tremendous courage for a person to make this call and even more courage for them to leave their abuser. It's obviously it's fear of being found by their abuser, but it's also the fear of leaving everything behind, including their savings and all their belongings. This is compounded by the extreme shortage of housing in this city. Uh, especially if you're, home, you write, you're in the homeless um, shelter system. And if you're a DV survivor living in a very separate shelter system, even further hidden from you and with less resources. But that changes today. Thank you to Mayor Adams, Deputy Mayor, all the commissioners who are here and not here. This took a village to make happen. Um, to, to bring these critical resources to domestic violence survivors and, as the mayor said, really listening to those who are doing this work on the ground. Um, we have Daenerys, Michelle, and Stephanie who are here today who have all been very brave sharing their story, and this is, this is a, um, a result of that. Um, our families need safe supportive housing. Um, many of our families need just a light, they just need somebody to look out for them. They just need permanent affordable housing, but they also need supportive housing. We have been fighting for this for decades. So this is a very big moment. Um, there's been um, a lot of our survivors, and this is not often talked about, but a lot of our survivors struggle with the long-term physical and mental effects of abuse and um, both them and the children who, who witness it and sadly sometimes experience it themselves. And so this is uh, incredible to be able to offer this resource to our tenants moving forward. I also wanna thank the Fund and Youth and Family Homelessness and the Helmsley Charitable Trust for funding the pilot that we're here celebrating today. We would not be able to do this without our private sector partners. They are seeding this program for the city and New Destiny to launch and um, we are confident that this will provide a strategy for ending family homelessness in the long run. And the deputy mayor slash stage manager, I'm sensing, wants me to wrap up. Um, so uh, I'll just say that lastly, I wanna thank my, my staff uh, for hitting the pavement day after day, showing that this can in fact be done, um, finding apartments, not saying no, moving heaven and earth to get our tenants, our DV survivors housed, and then again, lastly, it has to be said, Daenerys, Stephanie, and Michelle, thank you for not being afraid to tell your story and being our heroes. I'm not feeling like deputy mayor today. I'm feeling like Miss Edna's youngest daughter. Very proud, very proud. Hopefully she's not watching. She can't hear too well anyway. She'll be like, you had on a nice dress, but what were you talking about? I say, it doesn't matter, mommy. Daenerys, come on up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My, morning. 
My name is Daniri Sospinal. I'm a domestic violence survivor and a member of New Destiny Survivor Voices Project. I'm one of the survivors who were connected to New Destiny for housing search assistance. When things happened, I was committed to do everything possible for me and my kids to get a safe, permanent home. That's when I reached out to New Destiny. They helped me apply for an emergency housing voucher through ENDGBV which came with the assistance of a housing navigator. My navigator, Tamika, was compassionate, kind, and dedicated to helping our family find a new place to live. She helped me with the housing search, talk to landlords, and find a place to live in a neighborhood with good schools for my kids, which was really important to me. Eventually, we found a new apartment, and everything started to change for the better. My abuse had left me with high anxiety and trauma, brain for years, but finally having a place of my own allowed me to actually start healing and planning for the future. The aftercare I received as part of the EHV voucher was pivotal to this, and it's allowed me to rebuild my life, my identity, with the support I needed to succeed. Now I'm absolutely thrilled to be standing here as we announce that aftercare and housing navigation, finally, these essential services that helped me so much through one of the most difficult points in my life would be available to even more survivors through Project Home. Every survivor deserves this opportunity. It is what has allowed me to prove that I can be successful, all while taking care of my children and my health. It is what has allowed my kids to thrive as they continue to grow up in a comfortable home. Thank you to the city, New Destiny, and the private funders for making this pilot pro program possible. I'm excited to see the difference it can make for survivors currently living in the shelter system. Stable housing is not a privilege, it's a right. And with the right tools and the right resources, I know that every single New Yorker can have access to this most basic of human needs. Thank you so much. Goodness, such a, like a basic human right, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Foundational. Most foundational thing that anyone can have. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'll take questions right now. Hopefully none for me, because I'm emotional, but we'll um, get the crew to answer some. So um, that microgrant program is available to any survivor to remain safely housed and avoid shelter entry. So it's slightly separate, right? So that's about keeping people in their homes so they can avoid shelter. And I think we have to keep working on both ends. So we're getting as many people out of shelter and housing and then those that are in housing, you know, for if they can stay in their housing and be safe, we want to keep them there. What about these vouchers? Are going to apply for migrant women? Because we know that migrant women are part of these victims. So these are City for HAPS vouchers. Uh, in order to qualify for City for HAPS, you need to be public assistance eligible. Um, that includes some of the recent asylum seekers, certainly not all of the recent asylum seekers. But uh, in addition, we're working very closely with the state, who has recently uh, created some, some housing vouchers that are available irrespective of immigration status. So we look forward to be able to serve a wider population going forward. Hundred families that are going to be in this are going to be picked randomly, right? Good, and then we'll do the evaluation that way. Good. On FEPS, um, just a couple of things on this. One, I mean, so this is for supportive housing, right? Just to. So we actually announced three different things today. Um, one is the enhanced housing navigation services working with New Destiny. That is for uh, families with City for HEPs vouchers who are in the DHS shelter system. And they can move anywhere uh, anywhere in the state actually with, with City for HEPs. Um, then we also announced expanded eligibility for supportive housing and for HPD homeless set-asides, um, which may be coupled with, with City for HEPs, but not necessarily. What are the criteria on the expanded eligibility? For uh, So in the past, it has been 
eligibility for uh, HPD units has been limited to those who are in DHS shelters. So that has excluded those in the HRA domestic violence shelter system. So now families who are in the HRA domestic violence system will be able to, to connect directly to the HPD homeless set-asides. Um, and for 1515 supportive housing, we are expanding the pool of eligibility beyond the narrow focus on serious mental illness and, and substance use to also include those who've experienced the trauma of domestic violence. So one, one last thing on TRIPS is, you know, I mean, the council pushed for an expansion that's implemented in the law. What's, where is that as far as the administration goes? Like, um... There's active litigation going on, so I'm not gonna comment on that. So we'll be identifying families in the DHS shelter system who have a, a domestic violence history that have been screened as uh, meeting the state standard for, uh, there's a specific state definition for domestic violence survivor. Um, we will, and those, we will identify families who've been newly allocated a city FAPS voucher, and then we're gonna have a randomized control, so actually another 100 families who meet the same definition, um, so that we're actually able to do a really rigorous assessment of the effectiveness here, uh, so that we can uh, demonstrate that this is something that we believe is worth investing in going forward. So it will be households that meet this, the state definition of domestic violence survivor. So unfortunately, at, a, at any given moment, somewhere between 35 and 50% of the heads of household entering the DHS shelter system are, have a history of domestic violence, excluding the asylum seekers. I mean, at any, that, that is who's entering the system at any point in time. There is certainly a broader eligibility pool. This is a pilot program. We're gonna be able to really test the effectiveness relative to the scope of services that are provided within the standard DHS shelter system. And I think, I absolutely believe it's something we can build on. Is there any estimate of how much it would cost annually and it could get baseline if it is, or I guess what the financial plan is going forward if the pilot is deemed successful? So we are very grateful for a $300,000 grant from the New York City Fund to end youth and family homelessness to support the housing navigation work. Um, and then in addition, the city is paying for the city for HEPs vouchers and that cost there will vary depending on the, the size of the family um, and where they're moving. Forty-three million was the money that we've put into the um, Woman Forward for program. So that's a bunch of different programs that we've done that we can get you that list for. I have a question on topic and off topic as well. Uh, that's what we have. No, okay. <laughs> Let's ask you a question. Um, hi, Masa Sadie. So nice to meet you, Mayor. I have a question about parking garage inspections. As you know, the parking garage owners are required to hire engineers to inspect the property. We found that hundreds of owners are not following the rules. The deadline was last year, and despite the $1,000 monthly fine, they're just not doing these inspections. What can the city do to encourage them to do these safety checks? You know, normally we talk about this on, on topic, uh, off topic uh, tomorrow, but you just were biting at the bit to answer, ask this question, and I just, it would have break, break my heart that I wouldn't answer your question, you know? Uh, uh, we need to get you speak with uh, Commissioner Otto to find out exactly where we are on this so we can be specific with Kayla and her newborn that's about to come. We'll, <laughs> we'll make sure that um, we connect you today to find out what exactly what that number is um, that you just uh, shared with us. I'm not aware of that, but uh, Commissioner Otto will be able to answer that directly. Okay. Yes. Idea of why there has been an uptick in domestic violence incidents. Mm. 
Uh, I'm not sure. And greater minds, maybe there's greater minds than mine. I, I think one thing that I always want to point out when we're talking about this is that we're still, you know, sort of seeing the impacts of COVID, right? Mm. And I think that that really is playing a role here where people were at home for years and couldn't always access the resources. We did our best to reach people virtually, but we weren't reaching everybody virtually, right? And families experienced economic hardship and other losses. So I think all of that compounds, and I think it's really important to sort of keep in mind as we're telling the story of, what we're, of what's happening over the past few years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.